Hello, Applied Physics students. Here is your um, teaching video for Concept Development Practice, page 27.1, about light. So question number one says, the Danish astronomer Olaus Romer made careful measurements of the period of a moon about the planet Jupiter. How this data enabled a calculation of the speed of light is described in your textbook on pages 534 and 535. Okay, so we have this in our textbook here, right, right here. So, the first question says, what is the diameter in kilometers of Earth's orbit around the sun? So, um, again, this information is in our textbook. Okay. And... They tell you, okay, that the Earth's orbit around the sun in diameter is 300,000 kilometers. Okay. So that is kind of right here. How much time is required for the light to travel across the diameter of the orbit? Again, when you read that, um, he discovered that there was a 1,000 second delay. Okay, so we're looking at the extra distance and the extra time, which was 1,000 seconds. How do these two quantities determine the speed of light? So we know that speed equals distance divided by time. So we know the distance is 300 million, or sorry, 300,000 kilometers. We know the time it takes for that to happen is 1,000 seconds, right? And so basically that means that three zeros are gonna cancel out Right, and we get a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. So again, what he was measuring here is the diameter in kilometers of the Earth's orbit. So right, that's talking about this, right? This distance right here is the 300,000 kilometers. And then he measured the time. He felt that there was a delay, okay? And he measured that time difference to be 1,000 seconds. So knowing that that distance and the time, we can figure out the speed of light. Next, it asks us to take a look at figure um, 27.4 on page 536. That this figure right here. Okay. So you should be looking at that. And number two says, study that figure in your textbook and answer the following. Which have longer wavelengths? So again here, we kind of have to remember that wavelength and frequency are inversely related, right? Remember that C equals wavelength times frequency. So if I wanna know long wavelengths, then I wanna know where we have a small frequency. So looking at this, right? Our frequency is 10 to the fourth to 10 to the 18th. So this is a smaller frequency. So these would have longer wavelengths. So the answer for which have longer wavelengths are the radio waves. Which have longer wavelengths, light waves, right, or gamma rays. So here's light, 
right? Here's gamma over here. And we want to know which have longer wavelengths. Again, longer wavelengths means a shorter frequency. So the one more to the left, which is the light. So the answer to that number or letter B is light. Letter C, which have higher frequency? So that's going to be a larger number. So again, this is frequency, right? And it's asking about between ultraviolet and infrared. So here's ultraviolet and here's infrared. So infrared, ultraviolet, and which has the higher frequency, that would mean it's more to the right. So it's ultraviolet. waves. Which have higher frequencies, ultraviolet or gamma? So again, here's ultraviolet, here's gamma. So again, gamma is more to the right on this chart. So it is gamma rays. That have a higher frequency. So we've looked at section 27.4 that's about light and transparent materials. And it, letter A says exactly what do vibrating electrons emit, right? And vibrating electrons give off, emit means give off. So vibrating electrons give off energy that is carried in an electromagnetic wave. And all of these, these were all examples of electromagnetic waves. Okay, radio, light, ultraviolet, gamma rays, all examples of electromagnetic rays, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Letter B, when ultraviolet light shines on glass, what does it do to the electrons in the gas structure, right? So again, we kind of read about that, and ultraviolet light causes the electrons to vibrate in residence. So that means, remember, with the same natural frequency okay, of the glass with the ultraviolet light. So what this means is the glass particles are vibrating at their natural frequency. And the UV light makes those vibrations bigger. We have that constructive interference that causes bigger um, vibrations. Letter C. When energetic electrons in the gas structure vibrate against neighboring atoms, what happens to that energy of vibration? Again, when they do that vibration, they cause heat. So the energy of vibration becomes heat. Any time kind of particles bump into each other, that bumping into each other causes heat. D. What happens to the energy of a vibrating electron that does not collide with its neighboring atoms? So let's say we're not producing such a big vibration that we vibrate into other particles. Then the energy is given off as light. So this is what happens when light is transmitted or passes through glass. 
the particles, the electrons start to vibrate, but it's not such a big vibration that they hit other particles. So instead, those vibrations are passed. That vibration energy is given off as light, and the next particle vibrates and then gives that light off or that energy off as light. The back side here, letter E, which range of light frequencies, visible or ultraviolet, is absorbed by glass? Okay, so absorbed means that it can't get through, and again, that is the ultraviolet. That's why you don't get a sunburn if you're sitting um, behind glass all day, even on a sunshiny day, because those ultraviolet rays that cause sunburn can't pass through the glass. So ultraviolet don't pass through the glass. They are absorbed. Which range of light frequencies, visible or ultraviolet, is transmitted through the glass? Transmitted means that it does pass. So it is visible light that passes through glass. How is the speed of light in glass affected by the succession of time delays that accompany the absorption and re-emission of light from atom to atom in the glass? the speed of light is slowed down. So the speed of light in glass is less than the speed of light in the air. And again, that has to do, your textbook kind of explained it as the um, electrons kind of gulp up that energy and then they have to like burp it back out so that the next atom electron can um, kind of absorb it or kind of gulp it and then burp it. And that gulp, burp, gulp, burp slows down the speed of light through glass. Letter H. How does the speed of light compare in water, glass, and diamond? And again, that was in your textbook, okay? Um, the speed of light in water, glass, and diamond um, is the slowest in the diamond. It's about 40%, okay, the speed of light, which is the letter C. Okay, um, then water's in the middle. Okay, because that's about 67% the speed of light. And then it's the fastest of these three through the glass, which is about three quarters or 75% the normal speed of light. Your book kind of used this with a decimal, right? They said 0.41 C is the speed in diamond, 0.67 C is the speed in water, and 0.75 C, C being the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per hour or per second, um, as the speed of light. The sun normally shines on both Earth and the moon. Both cast shadows. Sometimes the moon's shadow falls on Earth, and at other times, Earth's shadow falls on the moon. The sketch shows the sun and Earth. Draw the moon in a position for a solar eclipse. So when we have a solar eclipse, the moon is between the sun and the Earth. So here's our moon. We can kind of put it wherever we want it to be. Okay. And this light from the sun is being projected onto the earth. Okay. 
and creating this area here, okay, where there would be a shadow on Earth. Okay, so this area here, right, there'd be a shadow there, and they would have this solar eclipse occurring. Um, ske the sketch also shows this sketch also shows the sun and the earth draw the moon in a position for a lunar eclipse. When it's a lunar eclipse, um, the moon is kind of, if you will, behind the earth. So here the moon is here. Okay, here's our moon, right? And it's definitely smaller than the earth. So. Here is our sun's rays and our earth creating a shadow. And in this case, our moon is inside of that shadow, and so we can't see the moon. Okay, so the moon disappears because it's in the shadow of the earth. Number five, the diagram shows the limits of light rays when a large lamp makes a shadow of a small object on a screen. Shade the umbra darker than the penumbra. In what part of the shadow could an ant see part of the lamp? Right, so here, right, this is our really, really dark area. Okay, this is our umbra. Okay, this area here, oops, I had to stay within the, the little marks they've made though, right? This area here, this is that penumbra, that's the partial shadow. So the umbra is a full shadow. The penumbra is the partial shadow. Okay, and then the question is, in what part of the shadow could an ant see part of the lamp? Anywhere that the ant is in the penumbra. Okay, so if the ant is in the penumbra, it could see part of the lamp. When it is in the umbra, it would not see the lamp at all. So again, we have these umbra, these full shadows, right? And this is that umbra up here, right? This is an umbra of the sun's light on the earth. And here, the moon is completely within the umbra that the earth is casting and can't be seen at all. So again, that's that umbra and penumbra. Remember, penumbras are also often kind of fuzzy. The lines aren't very sharp. Umbras usually have pretty sharp lines. So I hope that helps you understand some of the properties of light. Have a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow.